Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Stacey Satang with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar today is titled Clean Slate Law. To let you know, this presentation is being recorded and will run approximately 60 minutes, including question and answer time. Additionally, please note that we are saving any information from the chat feature. We'll also send you a link to the email recording within the next few days, as well as upload it to our YouTube channel and our website. Attendees, you will be muted during today's presentation. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. If you have a logistical question for myself and other Housing Alliance staff, please put that in the chat feature. The chat should not be used for questions for the presenters. I'll now turn it over to Gail Schwartz to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, webinar on the Clean Slate Law. Um, this is pretty much a landmark uh, law. It's the first in the country to seal criminal records through an automated process, and this really has uh, profound impacts on people who often have had housing opportunities put out of reach due to their um, past interactions with the criminal justice system. So uh, we do want to make sure that we get the best information out there about, you know, how this law works um, and, and the process and what everybody needs to know to ensure that um, their records uh, that are eligible to get cleaned are, are getting cleaned. And so we're really thrilled to have two folks from community legal services here with us who are just really spearheading this effort and uh, advancing this resource across Pennsylvania. So first we have Jamie Gullen. Uh, she is the supervising attorney in the employment unit at Community Legal Services, where she specializes in addressing barriers to employment, especially those caused by criminal records. Jamie is a part of the team that advocated for and is implementing Pennsylvania's Clean Slate Law. Uh, again, this is the first program of its type in the community. She also oversees the Clean Slate Screening Project and Expungement Program and is helping to bring information and advice about record clearing to thousands of Pennsylvanians. So we are just so thrilled that she um, is here to share that great information with us. We also have Jessa Boner, Boner, who is a paralegal also on the Community Legal Services team. She coordinates the Clean Slate Screening Program, which to date has screened thousands of Pennsylvanians for eligibility for criminal record sealing under the new law through a robust pro bono volunteer program. Jessa also helps individuals overcome criminal records as a barriers to employment by organizing clinics and other community events. So uh, with that, I am going to um, hand it over to our presenters, to Jessa first. And again, just to remind everybody on the webinar today, if you have a question for the presenter, please use the Q&A feature. Um, <clears throat> great, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen here really quickly. All right. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm um, really happy to be able to share this information with you. Um, just quickly, what we're going to be covering today. So um, the law is a little bit complicated, so we definitely want to spend some time um, explaining it. So we're going to do an overview of the three different types of record clearing options um, that Pennsylvanians have access to. Um, these are expungements, um, sealing, and pardons. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how um, record clearing and especially the clean slate law um, impact employment for Pennsylvanians and then also how it will impact housing. Okay, so to start, um, let's talk about the uh, three different types of convictions um, that people might have on their record because this will help us to understand a little bit better the kind of complicated laws around um, Queensland. 
So first, um, the lowest level offenses are what are called summary offenses, um, and these will show up on a record with an S. Um, and these are things like really low level retail theft, um, disorderly conduct, harassment. These are the types of things that like usually you will get written a citation for um, and are not considered to be an arrest. Um, after summary, we have um, our, what we could consider maybe mid-tier offenses, um, which are misdemeanors, and these are going to show up on a record as an M, and there might be a number that's attached to that M. Um, so important to remember that the lower the number, the more serious the conviction. So an M1 on a record is going to be a lot more serious than an M3, um, but misdemeanors are usually um, things like drug possession, um, DUIs, um, something like a simple assault. And then finally, we have um, felony convictions, which are going to show up on a record as an F. Um, and these are our most serious offenses for things like burglary, um, drug possession with intent to distribute, or like dealing drugs, um, or something like aggravated assault. Okay, so just to um, back up and get a broad picture, um, we are going to definitely dig into these um, different types a little bit. So don't, if it's a little confusing, um, don't be alarmed. But um, just to get what we call the 30,000 foot view of record clearing in Pennsylvania. So um, expungement is um, the first option for record clearing. And it's relatively easy. Um, it basically involves um, filing some paperwork in the court. Um, and if you are granted an expungement, then that record is completely destroyed. However, the eligibility of convictions um, for expungement are it's, uh, pretty limited in scope. Um, and so next we're going to talk about um, clean slate. And you'll notice that there's two different options for clean slate. Um, there's the automatic piece and then some things that are eligible for clean slate but need to be sealed um, by petition. Um, and so if you have something that is eligible to be sealed automatically by clean slate, that is the easiest way to get your record sealed because you don't have to do anything at all. It just um, happens automatically. Um, however, important to note, and we're going to talk more about this, that when a record is sealed by clean slate, it means that most people cannot see that record, but there are some limited instances in which that record um, is still available. And um, automatic sealing for clean slate is available for um, people who have um, a minor record, so like things like summary offenses and then those lower level misdemeanors that we were talking about, so M3s and M2s. Um, and then so for some convictions that aren't eligible to be sealed um, automatically under clean slate, um, the clean slate law did expand um, petition based sealing and that's like relatively easy. Um, again, like the expungement, you need to file some paperwork with the court, but again, um, the same as I was talking about for clean slate automatic, there are some limited instances where that record can be seen. And petition sealing is um, eligible, is possibility in cases with summary offenses, um, M3s, M M2s, um, and then M1s, which are not eligible for um, automatic, automatic sealing under clean slate, um, are um, eligible, but there are some important um, exclusions of certain types of M1s that aren't eligible for sealing by petition, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then lastly, we have um, pardons, um, and this is the most difficult process, and it's very long. It takes a few years, but if you are granted a pardon, then your record is completely destroyed, um, and pardon is an option for those convictions that are not eligible to be sealed. Um, so any conviction, including felony convictions, which right now are not eligible to be sealed under the clean slate law. Okay, so um, let's dig in a little bit to expungement. So expungement, as we were saying, is the, um, the most limited form. So um, expungement is possible for um, non-convictions on your record. So this is what we might refer to as dropped charges. So this is for... Um, uh, things on your record that were dropped, so they might show up as dismissed, withdrawn, null prost, or not guilty. Um, expungement is also an option for completed diversion programs. So these are things um, that might show up on a record as ARD. And this is when you generally need to complete something like um, community service or classes and pay all the costs and fines. But if you complete all of the requirements of the diversionary program, then that should be eligible for expungement. 
Um, also, those lowest levels, the summary convictions, if you have a five-year arrest-free period, if you have five years where you haven't been convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony, then um, those summary offenses would be eligible for expungement. And then if you are um, a, a person who is 70 years or older and has a 10-year arrest-free period, anything on their record um, is eligible to petition for expungement, and many juvenile cases as well. Um, also note that um, partial expungement might be possible in some cases where um, some of the information is eligible to be expunged and some cannot. So for example, if you have um, a record where you have some really serious non-conviction um, dropped charges, um, so if you have some really serious dropped charges along with some things that are not eligible for expungement, it might be worth it for you to try to, ex to expunge those dropped charges so that you can shorten your record and clean it up a little bit. Um, and you might have noticed that all of these things um, should be eligible for automatic sealing under the Clean Slate Law, which is also something that's um, really great about the Clean Slate Law and that like um, some people that might not even be aware that they're eligible for expungement might have some things on their record, um, it should seal automatically. But there are some cases where you might want to take that next step and um, seek an expungement. Okay, so moving on to the Clean Slate Law. Um, so, as was mentioned, the Clean Slate Law was a groundbreaking law in Pennsylvania. It was the first of its kind to automatically seal some records from public view. And right now, other states are looking at um, and in different processes of um, trying to replicate or do something similar, but it was the first of its kind that we had here in Pennsylvania. Um, so, the Clean Slate Law should automatically seal, meaning that you don't have to do anything, um, many nonviolent misdemeanor convictions after 10 conviction for three years. So um, these are going to be your M2s, your M3s, and your Ms that are not nonviolent. Um, summary convictions after 10 years. So if you don't seek an expungement for your summary after five years, it should automatically seal after 10 years. And then any non convictions on your record um, shortly after the disposition should automatically seal. Um, and the Clean Slate Law also expanded petition-based sealing to include a lot of first-degree misdemeanors. Um, so there are some important exceptions that aren't eligible for Clean Slate, but now um, if you have a first-degree misdemeanor, you may be able to seal it. Um, all first-degree misdemeanors, are you're going to have to petition seal them if they're eligible. They're not going to be able to seal automatically. And then some other um, things like second-degree, like M2 simple assault, um, uh, is also, uh, and so just some other things um, are also eligible to be sealed under petition-based sealing, um, but really important to note that for both automatic and petition-based sealing, um, you're going to have to, you have to pay all your fines and costs before they can be sealed. So any court fees or court fines and costs that you have, as well as restitution, need, need to be paid before they are able to automatically seal or be sealed by petition. Um, and then just some important, um, this is getting a little uh, deep in the weeds here, but just, just to mention some um, things that are not eligible to be sealed that are M1, so what are known as Article B offenses, so these are crimes of violence, so for example, an M1 terroristic threat or an M1 stalking um, is not going to be eligible for clean slate, so you would need to seek a pardon to clear that from your record. Also, Article D offenses, which are crimes against the family. So um, the one that we see most common, I think, is the M1, endangering welfare of children, is not eligible. Um, most firearms offenses are not eligible to be sealed. Um, sexual offenses are, and offenses where you're required to register as a sex offender aren't going to be eligible for sealing. Um, nor is M1 corruption of minors and attempts, conspiracy, or solicitation to commit any of the above. Um, these are not going to be eligible for sealing under clean slate. You would need to seek a pardon um, to clear them from your record, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so just to emphasize, um, before um, an eligible record can be sealed under clean slate, all the court's uh, court ordered financial obligations must be paid. Um, if, uh, if that includes what's called as a supervision fee, which shows up as OSP on a docket sheet. In some instances, those can be waived, but otherwise the individual needs to pay um, what they owe and they have some options to enter a payment plan or if the court fines and costs were sent to collections, they may be able to ask to take those back. 
but just just important to note that um, all fines and costs do need to be paid in order to benefit from clean slate um, sealing. Okay, so um, I mentioned that there are some instances in which a record that has been sealed might be able to be accessed, but when a record is sealed, the vast majority of people can't see it. So the general public will not be able to see a sealed record, landlords, schools, licensing board. So if someone is seeking um, a license for a specific occupation, they should not be able to see a sealed record. And the vast majority of employers are not going to be able to see a sealed record. Um, but there are some important exceptions that you should know about. So um, right now, FBI records do still show um, things that have been sealed. Um, law enforcement will still have access to the sealed record, um, as well as gun ownership applications. Um, immigration and international travel, and um, if you're seeking admission to the bar, um, your sealed record is still going to be um, visible in those cases. Okay, so now I am going to pass it over um, to Jamie, who's going to tell us about pardons. Jamie, Jamie you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone uh, for having us and um, to Jessa for outlining the clean slate law. Um, even though this presentation is about clean slate, we wanted to take a minute to talk about pardons because clean slate has done such a good job removing criminal record information. Um, most of the folks we're seeing coming through our office and most of the folks you may interact with who have records are gonna have information on their record that wasn't eligible to be sealed. Um, and the only way to clear up that information may be through the pardon process. So we just wanted to make sure to touch on that a little bit. Um, as Jessica explained, the pardon process is the only remedy available if you're not eligible for expungement or sealing. And pretty much anybody with a felony conviction right now is gonna need a pardon in order to fully clear up their record. We're hoping that we'll expand Clean Slate in the future to include felony records, but for now the pardon process is the only available way for people with felonies and some other misdemeanor records to be able to clear up their record. The pardon process is a lot harder and longer than the expungement and sealing processes. It can take anywhere from three to five years. But the good news is that the process has been getting a lot easier. Um, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, John Fetterman, has undertaken a huge effort to streamline the process. They've removed all of the costs associated with applying for a pardon. They've removed a lot of the steps in the process, making it a lot easier for folks to apply. And the board is greatly expanding the ability of people to actually get heard by the board and have their pardons recommended to the governor. Um, so there really hasn't been a better time to encourage folks to apply for pardons. Um, although, you know, if somebody has a super recent or more serious conviction, it may be a little bit more of an uphill battle at the Board of Pardons. Uh, for folks who are looking for more information about pardons, the Board of Pardons has a really great website and the application is available to download for free right on the website and has really thorough and comprehensive instructions. There's also information about when the Board of Pardons meets and things of that nature on there. So that's usually the first stop shop that we send people to if they're interested in exploring a pardon. Jesse can advance. So in the first year of Clean Slate, um, just to give you a sense of the numbers, there were 35 million records sealed. Uh, over 1 million Pennsylvanians have benefited from having something on their record sealed. That doesn't mean 1 million Pennsylvanians had their whole record sealed, but 1 million Pennsylvanians had some kind of information on their criminal record sealed. Um, Non-convictions, uh, as long as there's no fines and costs on the case, have been sealed, and all convictions currently eligible have been sealed. So because there's the 10-year waiting period, folks who had convictions from 10 years ago or longer have already benefited, but Clean Slate continues to roll out going forward. So if somebody had a conviction that's eligible nine years ago, in one year they'll get that sealed. So it's a continual process where the computer queries are running searches and finding people who are newly eligible going forward. 
So Jessa and I work in the employment unit, so I should caveat the next couple of slides by saying we are not experts when it comes to housing, but uh, we are experts when it comes to employment. Um, and I understand that a lot of folks watching this webinar may be in a position to help people uh, try to steer them in the direction of employment as well, because, you know, employment is necessary to being able to sustain housing. So we wanted to touch a little bit on the employment impacts of ceiling before we move on to the housing impacts. So like Jessa said, most employers cannot see a sealed record. So the vast majority of say like your big box stores or um, your kind of run in the mill mom and pop shops, those types of employers are not gonna be able to see sealed records. The only exception to that really is jobs requiring an FBI background check which are jobs you would imagine that are highly protective either for vulnerable populations or sensitive information. So for example, schools, police departments, um, jobs that require contact with children, um, airports or seaports, hazmat endorsed commercial driver's licenses, things of that nature. Um, those types of jobs are able to access FBI background checks. They need explicit authorization to do so. Most employers are, just, are not allowed to just go get an FBI background check on somebody. So although it's not great that FBI records show sealed records and we're trying to fix that, fortunately it's a limited universe of employers who are able to access those. Um, the FBI has also recently undertaken a new sealing program where they've started to seal records. And so we're hopeful that we'll be able to um, get our state police here in Pennsylvania to work with the FBI to start sealing records here as well. So hopefully that issue will be addressed eventually going forward. Um, in terms of what folks, this is always the kind of practical question if you're advising folks, they wanna know what do I say if I'm asked about a sealed record? First of all, I always like to just note that in Philadelphia, under our fair chance hiring law, employers should not be asking about criminal records on the application or during the interview process. Only once a conditional job offer has been made can they inquire about a record. Unfortunately, we know that unfortunately employers do inquire and also for folks who are looking for jobs outside of Philadelphia, they may be asked on the application. So if somebody is asked about whether they have a record, um, they do not need to disclose either expunged or sealed cases. That was a change with the clean slate law. There was no explicit law before that, even for expungements about not needing to disclose. So that's really huge. Um, and then kind of going along with that is most employers are not allowed to make hiring decisions based on sealed records. Again, there's a very, very tiny exception that a federal law requires sealed records to be considered, which is for a very narrow set of jobs in very protected industries like banks. Um, they may be able to, but the vast, vast, vast majority of employers, even those that might access an FBI record, still are not allowed to use sealed records in hiring decisions. And finally, another big change with the clean slate law, Jessa mentioned, is that occupational licensing boards can no longer consider sealed records. They used to be able to under our prior sealing law, and now they cannot. So housing, uh, the subject that brings us here today. Um, so again, I just caveat that I'm not an expert on housing. I did consult, we, Jess and I both consulted with some folks in our housing unit at CLS. In the chat, you'll see our general intake line number as well as our housing unit intake line number. Um, for folks who have specific concerns about housing, we do have a landlord tenant unit and they operate a landlord tenant hotline and they are experts on um, all things housing related, but also can advocate for folks who are being denied housing based on their records. Uh, but we wanted to give some basic overview of how Clean Slate impacts housing from our understanding. So um, individuals whose records have been expunged or sealed, the disclosure rule that I just mentioned for employment applies to housing too. They do not need to disclose them on a rental application unless somehow they're required by federal law to do so. I don't think there are any federal law requirements to do so, but if there were, that would be an exception. So generally, if somebody's asked on a rental application, do you have a record and it's been sealed or expunged, they can say no. Unfortunately, there's no explicit prohibition the way there is for employers on landlords utilizing sealed records. But in practice, the vast majority of landlords are not going to be able to see sealed records to be able to use them. And if people aren't having to disclose them either, 
in practice, hopefully this is solving a huge issue for folks with records that were eligible to be expunged or sealed. Um, our understanding, and I'm sure folks on this webinar know more than we do, but uh, is that most housing providers use commercial tenant screening companies uh, to do their tenant-based background screening. And we do see some of that at CLS where folks are coming in with commercially prepared uh, reports for that their landlords ran on them. Um, those types of commercially prepared reports should not be reporting sealed cases. Unfortunately, sometimes they do anyway, uh, but that could potentially be a violation of what's called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Those commercial agencies have certain obligations for fair and accurate reporting under the law. And if cases have been expunged or sealed, they're not supposed to be reported anymore. Um, and so reporting it can violate federal law. Um, if you see folks who are having background reports that are reporting those cases, you can definitely refer those cases to CLS. Um, we represent people in fair credit reporting cases and co-counsel um, on those cases with other attorneys um, for both employment and we've brought cases in the tenant screening context as well. The other thing to note is Pennsylvania actually kind of has a model policy around this. Um, because the courts contract with the commercial background screening companies um, and sell them the court data that they use for their reports, in that contract, there's actually a requirement that they follow our expungement and sealing orders, and that when cases are expunged or sealed, they come out of the commercial background databases. And to make it even stronger, our courts actually prepare a list every month called the life cycle file. And they send that list to the commercial screeners that they contract with and say, here's a list of all the cases that were sealed by Clean Slate this month. You know, the millions of cases. <laughs> Take them out of your commercial background databases. And that puts the companies on even stronger notice that they need to remove those cases. And then again, if they fail to do so, especially after they were directly notified, um, then it's an even stronger potential violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So there are a lot of remedies in this area. Folks are having cases misreported. Other types of errors, I'll just mention other types of errors too that might come up on a background report, like getting the grade of the offense wrong or not having the right outcome of the case. Any errors like that that you're seeing coming up on commercial tenant screening reports could also potentially um, be violations of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So if you do see those issues, definitely feel free to refer folks to CLS for that. The only way a housing provider would be able to seal, seal, see sealed cases would be if they were off, authorized to do an FBI background check. Uh, because again, those FBI checks would show sealed records. Our understanding is at least the vast majority of housing providers do not have access to do an FBI background check, but I just put that in there in case there's, you know, some program out there that we're not aware of that has that kind of authorization. That would be the only type of example of when a housing provider would actually be able to see a sealed record. So this website is kind of the one-stop shop for everything you need to know about Clean Slate. It's conveniently called mycleanslatepa.com, so it's easy to remember. Um, individuals can go to this website and check their own eligibility for Clean Slate if they put their information in. This website will actually help run the court search for them to find and pull whatever criminal records they may have, and we'll give them detailed information about what's on their record and what may or may not be eligible for being cleared. Um, people also get entered onto a list serve that we monitor where we send out periodic updates and reminders uh, regarding changes or um, things happening with Clean Slate. So for example, you know, folks owe court fines and costs and that's been a reason they haven't been able to benefit from Clean Slate. We're currently working on a bill, HB 440, that would remove the fines and costs requirement before you can benefit from Clean Slate. So if a change like that in the law happened and people were on our list, they would get an update and notification about changes like that or just general information we send out about the rights that people have with criminal records. So there are a lot of benefits to folks going to our website and signing up. Um, yeah, Jamie, I just wanted to jump in because I saw that we had um, a question that's relevant to this, which is that someone asks, um, are individuals notified when their record has been sealed? Um, and so the answer to that question is um, no, there is currently no way that, um, that 
for an official notification to come. And this is part of the reason why we developed what um, our initial project was called the uh, Clean Slate Screening Program, where um, back when the, um, back after, um, right after the, the law was passed, we collected names of, um, there were like almost 9,000 Pennsylvanians who wanted to have their records screened to see if they might be eligible. And so that, that program um, is no longer running, but this is kind of, um, we in part uh, wanted to create this capability on this website to help individuals to, to find out for themselves whether or not that they might be eligible. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Jamie. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, so that was kind of the overview and basic information. I see there are a lot of questions in the Q&A, so we figured we'll just get into more details through the questions. So we can Great. start the Q&A. Thank you so much uh, for that really, really detailed and informative uh, presentation. I do want to say we are recording today's webinar. We are going to be sharing the slides from today's webinar. We'll also include a link to the website um, as well. So please know that that information will be coming in follow up to today's webinar. Now, our first question, um, I'm going to summarize a couple of questions here, but for the Pennsylvania Clean Slate Law, how does this apply to somebody who maybe has federal charges or is living in Pennsylvania but has charges that happened in uh, or a record from another state? That's a great question. So the Clean Slate Law, all record clearing laws really are state by state. So every state has its own system and scheme for how record clearing happens. Some states have expungement, some states have sealing, some states have both. In some states, there's a really complicated petition process. In some states, it's automatic. Um, unfortunately, at the federal level, there's currently no record clearing remedy at all. So even if you're found not guilty on federal charges, you can't expunge that record, which is horrible. Um, but currently, there is legislation proposed in Congress to have a federal clean slate act that would, would at least allow non-convictions and some marijuana convictions to be expunged automatically. So hopefully, we'll see that gain traction in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, but for now, unfortunately, there's really no remedy for federal records. Um, but if you lived in Pennsylvania and you had a record in a different state, you'd actually have to see what the laws in that state were regarding whether you would be able to get your record expunged or sealed. Now, another kind of interesting part of that is say you have a Pennsylvania record and you have a record from another state. Uh, the nice thing about the computer run query is it's not really possible to pull in information about what's happening in other states or at the federal level. So when Jessa was talking about those waiting periods of 10 years without another misdemeanor or felony conviction, our courts can only run those queries based on Pennsylvania information. So if you did have a conviction in a different state or at the federal level, those would not be actually taken into account uh, when measuring that 10 year period. It's only based on Pennsylvania's data and information. Great, thank you. Uh, there are some clarifying questions. There were acronyms shared earlier in the presentation. What does AOPC mean as well as PSP? It Jess, I do <laughs> um, No, because I'm not, I mean, uh, PSP is <laughs> Pennsylvania <laughs> State Police and AOPC stands for <laughs> The Administrative <laughs> Office of Pennsylvania Courts. So that's just the fancy term for our courts and our state police systems. And that's where the records like live. Great. Uh, so yeah, the courts and the state police. Um, our next question is, if someone returns to jail on a violation of parole or probation, but there are no new charges, does this interrupt the 10 year conviction free period? So another great thing about Clean Slate in terms of like how the data queries have to be run for it to be able to work is that traditionally a lot of record clearing laws and our law before Clean Slate all ran from the time a sentence was completed. And so in the scenario that um, this person is suggesting, say you have multiple violations, you end up being on probation. As we know, people can end up on probation for many years um, with violations. So that could really affect how long people are waiting for record clearing. 
So the nice thing about clean slate is that everything runs from the date of conviction, not from one sentence was completed. And so um, that 10 year period really just whatever you were convicted, that's the date it runs from. So even if you ended up on probation for five years or seven years, that wouldn't actually lengthen the amount of time that you needed to wait to get uh, record clearing. And the reason for that, again, is just the data in the system that the courts use to run these queries, like those data points have to be there. And there aren't data points that tell you in the system when somebody's probation finishes. So it had to run off of date of conviction. Um, and so that actually really benefits people in a lot of contexts because those types of violation issues don't end up then extending the waiting periods. Great. And just to, to clarify, um, a person uh, with one of the eligible offenses does have to go the full 10 years without an incident uh, in order for the automatic sealing and petitioning. There's nothing that's just automatically sealed right away. Um, yes, other than drop charges or non-convictions. And then the other important thing to note is that summary conviction. So those um, those ones that show up as with an S on your record that are the lowest level convictions, those don't count against you in that um, 10 year time frame. So say that you had a misdemeanor conviction that is going to be eligible for automatic sealing um, in 2005, but then in 2007, you got like an S um, disorderly conduct. That M should still be eligible in 2015 because the summary won't count against those 10 years. Great. And then um, how is it verified that an employer did not make a decision based on a sealed record? That's a great question. Um, so in most cases, they're not going to be able to see it, so they can't make a decision based on it. But in those cases, let's take a case where somebody is trying to work for a school and they had an FBI background check run and it showed a sealed case and the school said, oh, we can't hire you because of this record. Unfortunately, on the FBI background check, it doesn't even say that the record was sealed. So it's just showing up as any other case would on the background report. Um, so the employer actually would have no way to know that that case was sealed. So the way that we see this come up is that somebody comes to us to say, I was denied this job based on my record. I thought it was sealed, uh, what's going on, and then we can advocate for them and say we can get proof that it was sealed, show that to the employer, explain that they're not allowed to consider it. But obviously that's not an ideal situation because it relies on people lawyer and advocating with the employer and then the employer accepting that and understanding it. So we fully recognize that's not an ideal system and and we're really hopeful the FBI will start sealing records because it's really hard to kind of clean that up after the fact for folks when the employer is able to see it and moreover doesn't even know that it's a sealed record. So hopefully we'll be able to address that problem more going forward, but it is definitely a challenge with the way the law is currently um, operating. Great. Um, so our next question is really for those who are working in the nonprofit social services sector, any, any place where a potential employer could run an FBI check, will arrest or charges associated with protesting show up and be an issue? So, um, Again, with FBI records, it's possible that arrests, so if it's an arrest that didn't lead to a conviction, so if charges were brought but then dismissed or dropped, um, that will be automatically sealed, but um, that would still show up on an FBI report, even if it was a non-conviction. So um, in, that, in the case where we know folks are applying in the social services sector, if they have non-convictions, we do recommend that they go ahead and get them fully expunged from their record through the petition-based process of expungement, um, just because we don't want folks to be in a position of having to have that information come up with it shouldn't be. Unfortunately for people who are convicted um, or have convictions that are eligible to be sealed, there is no expungement process for that. So then they're kind of back in the situation I was just talking about where it's going to show up on the FBI report, but shouldn't be considered. And then they're kind of in that space. Um, the other thing to note is that a lot of folks who protest end up with summary citations on their records. Some of those are civil violations, which don't actually even show up on a criminal record, but say they were cited for disorderly conduct, which is a summary criminal 
um, offense and they were convicted on that. Um, even though that would show up, that would show up unless it's been expunged or sealed, it's been five or 10 years, that's gonna show up on any kind of record. But under Pennsylvania law, we didn't get a ton into the employment laws today, but um, under Pennsylvania law, summary citations and convictions actually are not allowed to be considered by employers. So if somebody is denied a job because of a summary, um, whether it's based on protesting or something else, um, they would have legal rights because summaries should not be being used against people in the employment sector. Great, thank you. Um, can someone receive a pardon while still on supervision, like parole? No, um, there aren't many explicit requirements for applying for a pardon, but that's pretty much the one. You have to finish your supervision before you can get a pardon. If you're still serving your sentence and you want that sentence to be um, reconsidered, there is a pro separate process for clemency. So if, if folks have been following the news at all, there's actually been a lot of news around the clemency process at the Board of Pardons and efforts to reform and expand that, especially for folks who are still serving um, life without parole sentences. That's an avenue to help bring folks home from those sentences. So that would be the clemency process. But for a pardon, you do have to have completed your supervision. There aren't a lot of other hard and fast rules but the Board of Pardons is more likely to grant a pardon if somebody has been able to show some period of time without um, any additional convictions. So usually we kind of ballpark about five years for a misdemeanor or a more minor record, uh, 10 years for a felony or a more serious and lengthy record. But that's not um, an explicit guideline. That's just kind of in our experience what leads people to be more successful and more likely to get a pardon. But as long as their supervision is complete, they are eligible to apply. Does sealing require the Commonwealth or the district attorney or victim consent? Um, no, uh, the automatic part of clean slate does not. So that was obviously a big compromise um, because you know the district attorneys association and judges you know like being able to weigh in and have discretion. Um, so part of the negotiations around what would qualify for automated sealing versus the petition-based process was very much with that in mind. Ultimately, the DA's association supported Clean Slate because they felt comfortable that when we're talking about non-convictions and when we're talking about more minor misdemeanors where people mm -hmm. haven't had any convictions in 10 years, that you know those were not cases where they felt they needed to be able to intervene and have discretion because they were such old and minor records. Um, but you can tell from the list that Jessa gave of what's in the petition-based category, those are things like more serious first-degree misdemeanors where there was a sense like things, or like things like simple assault, there was a sense that it's important on those types of cases for there to be a discretionary review process and things like simple assault might be associated with something like, not always, but could be associated with something like domestic violence. And so there was a sense that for those types of offenses, there was more of a need for a petition-based process where the DA's office could still review um, those cases. Although it's pretty clear under the way the petition process is written that if you meet the qualifications or sort of a presumption, you'll be eligible. But those cases do still go through a petition-based process. The DA can still weigh in on it and it does still go before a judge. So that was sort of the balance that went into negotiating the law and what would be automatic versus petition-based. Um, so, and the District Attorneys Association, like I said, was very involved in those conversations and ultimately supported um, what ended up being passed. Great. And for those who are interested in pursuing uh, the petition route, like how do they initiate that process? Uh, is there a place to find forms, documents, anything like that? Yeah, so um, it vary, everything varies, unfortunately, county by county. So it depends on what county they're in around the state. There is a template form that the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts puts online. So even if you just search like PA Courts form, for, it's called limited access under the law. So don't get confused if you see limited access. That's the same as ceiling. 
uh, but that's the technical term. So if you just Google form for limited access in Pennsylvania, you'll see the court's template form for that. You can, anybody can use that form in any county. They're not allowed to require a specific form by county. Um, but then the procedures vary a lot by county in terms of whether there are filing fees, how, what those filing fees are, whether you can get them waived, um, things like what the process is for district attorney review and consent and whether hearings are regularly held and how contested they are all kind of vary by county. Um, here in Philadelphia, folks can come to CLS if they're low income and are looking for help with the petition-based process. If folks are in other counties outside of Philadelphia, I'd suggest going to the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network website um, to find the legal aid program in that specific county. And that can be a way to help folks through the process because it can be a little bit complicated to navigate on your own. Great. Uh, what about juvenile records? I mean, oftentimes they're typically not made public, but um, is, is there anything to note that would be significant for that population to know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so juvenile records were actually somewhat impacted by the clean slate law, um, but in a kind of different way. So they're not part of the automated sealing process because there is a feeling that um, among juvenile justice advocates that expungement where you completely destroy the record was a more appropriate remedy for juvenile records. But the clean slate law um, did provide more confidentiality for certain types of juvenile records. So the person who asked this question rightly noted that um, only some types of juvenile records can be released publicly. It used to be any felony adjudication if the young person was 14 or over, or certain serious felonies if they were 12 or 13 at the time or older. Um, and uh, Clean Slate changed that to make it a little bit more expansive. So now only the most kind of serious category of felony offenses are available. Um, on say a state police background check for an employer if the young person was 14 or over at the time. So it narrowed what kinds of information can be released. And then, th so there's not an automated process for sealing or expunging um, those records, but there is an expungement process for juvenile records. Um, the basic rule is that once five years have passed since the time that your supervision in the juvenile courts has ended or the case has been closed, you pretty much automatically, should, not automated, but you should be automatically eligible. You do still have to file a petition. Um, and only if the district attorney can show good cause should you be denied. So there's a presumption that if it's been five years, you got your juvenile adjudication expunged. Um, if it's, you want to seek expungement of a juvenile record earlier than that, it is possible, but the district attorney's office has to agree. If they don't agree, you can't get it done earlier than the five-year time period. So people do have to navigate that, though, through a petition-based process. So again, that can be kind of challenging and varies a lot depending on the county that you're in, but a lot of legal aid programs will also help, including CLS, will also help young people through that process as well. So having a record can often impact a, a person's chance to access employment, which uh, can impact their ability to pay those fines and costs that are, are necessary for, for this process. So are there any uh, assistance programs out there or grants offered to um, assist in those instances where uh, a financial hardship is just really putting it out of reach to, to pay those fines and debts off. Unfortunately, there's not a great answer to that. Um, we were working with a philanthropy for a little while that was helping to provide small grants in situations where people had a small amount of debt owed and that clearing it up would greatly help them either get their record cleared or in some other way. Um, but that program isn't in existence anymore. So that kind of small thing we had doesn't exist, unfortunately. Um, the most we can really do for folks is that if they owe something called supervision fees, which is what you're charged for what the time that you're on probation or parole, you get charged every single month for being on supervision. Um, those fees are eligible to be waived and they can even be waived retroactively. So we do help people apply um, and motion the court for waiver of those fees, um, which can help reduce how much people owe and get them closer to being able to get their records sealed. 
Um, but if they owe other types of fines or costs or restitution, there's not really much of a way right now. Um, it's kind of all being litigated in the Pennsylvania courts right now about whether you can waive other types of fines and costs. But for now, supervision fees are the only um, type of debt that can be routinely waived. And so uh, folks do have to address those other fines and costs, which is a huge hardship for people. And that's why we're hoping that this um, bill I mentioned, HB 440, will pass. Um, and our argument to support that bill is, you know, these records are being sealed, the court still has the information about what's owed, but you're much more likely to actually get people to pay back uh, their court fines and costs if they're able to get jobs. So sealing the record and letting folks get employment will only help people be able to pay because if they're not employed, they're not going to be able to spend the very limited resources they have on their court fines and costs are going to be focused on putting food on their family's table. Um, so we're hopeful that that um, reasoning has resonated in Harrisburg and uh, that HB 440 will pass, which will allow people to get their records sealed. Even if they owe fines and costs, they'd only have to be able to address any restitution mode. Great. And I think we've run through most of our questions. Um, so I do just want to give you guys an opportunity. If somebody has a very specific instance uh, with a, a client or a resident or somebody that they're working with, what is the best number for them to call or, or contact to learn more about clean slate options? Jessa, do you want to take that one? I'm trying to see if I can find it with my screen share. So. <laughs> Sorry. I can do it if you want. Okay. No mind. Okay. So there are a couple of numbers we wanted to make sure people had. Um, Jessa put them in the chat. Um, CLS's general intake line is 215-981-3700. Right now, because we're still working remotely, when you call that number, there's like a long message with different numbers to press for different types of legal issues. So it's a little hard to get through. But once you get through, um, so for example, if somebody was being denied employment because of a record, um, they would uh, go through the uh, message and get to number seven, which is the employment units box, and they'd be able to leave a message and then one of our intake staff would be able to call them back. Um, if folks are having housing specific issues related to their record or just you know if you're encountering other landlord tenant issues with the folks that you work with um, the land we also operate a landlord tenant helpline that you may already be aware of but just to give folks that number it's 267-443-2500 if you're hoping to just advise somebody or get them connected to record clearing help, that all runs through our employment unit for the most part. Um, sometimes our housing unit takes those cases, but we really specialize in that in our employment unit. So it's probably best to send them through our general intake line if they're looking for record clearing help. So again, that's 215-981-3700. Those numbers are in the chat. They're at the very top of the chat. Um, so you should see them written down there. And you can also find all of this information online at clsphila.org. So if you lose what's in the chat or you forget, just feel free to go to Community Legal Services website and you'll be able to access all the information about the issues we help with and how to connect to our services. Great, and, and not just service providers can reach out to you, it can also be the person with the record directly, correct? Absolutely, actually it's preferable that the person with the record calls our intake line because we'll have to do the intake directly with them. So it's best if you can refer folks through our intake line. Um, if you do have a question, I think Jessa, did you have our email addresses up at the end of the PowerPoint? Um, I think you did, <laughs> if you wanna put those back up for a sec. Um, if you have a question about whether somebody is eligible, um, we're always happy to field a quick email. Even if you can just send us somebody's name and date of birth, we can always just quickly look them up and say like, yes, they're eligible, no, they're not. If you wanna avoid sending people through intake processes unnecessarily, we're always kind of conscious of not wanting to, you know, even though we're not physically running people around town right now, even just like, you know, sending people through unnecessary hoops, feel free to just shoot us a quick email and let us know the situation. And we can, you know, either say yes, send them here, or we can't help with that issue or whatever it may be. So definitely feel free to reach out to us as service providers in that way. But if you're definitely referring somebody for an intake, it's best if they can call in themselves. Great. 
And, and just to reiterate, so um, for our intake line, it should be um, individuals that have a Philadelphia-based issue, but if it's in another county, then you can um, go to the plan website, or if you Google legal service and your county name, then you'll want to find the legal services program in that county. Great. And then if there is anybody out there who maybe wants to get a training like this at a more specific uh, local level, um, is that should they reach out to you all directly or should they reach out to their local legal services? You can reach out to us and we can put you in touch. It's probably hard to reach the right person if you're just kind of going to the generic legal aid number. So feel free to just email us and tell us what county you're looking for and we can probably more directly connect you to one of our colleagues in a different legal aid program. Fantastic. Well, I think we are at the end of our hour and uh, this was really, really thorough, fantastic information. I wanna thank both of our presenters today. Uh, we have been recording this webinar. We uh, also are going to be sending out the PowerPoint presentation. And um, thank you all for joining today's webinar and look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great afternoon.